<laughs> Do I have critters watching? Ah, uh, yes, eight critters watching. Hello, my critters. Today, we're going to talk about 3D printing and model rocketry. Hello, John Potts. So, 3D printing is, um, well, it's pretty revolutionary as far as pretty much any hobby in the world is concerned. Because it allows people who do not have the hand skills... So you might be great with a lathe and a jigsaw and a circular saw and a band saw and a hacksaw and every other kind of saw tool and machine available that allows us to make you know, vacuum forming and all this stuff. But most of it usually requires relatively expensive tools to do and a very large learning curve in how to actually use those tools to actually get something usable. Can I carve a wooden nose cone? Sure. Is it going to look that good? Probably not. <laughs> 3D printing, however, is kind of, um, think of 3D printing as T Earl Grey hot, like Star Trek replicator, but at its very most primitive stage, the very beginnings of replicator technology. The advantage of 3D printing is that I can design a part and then have the machine make the part and then i can have it make the part again and again and again and again and again and that will part will be as perfect as last time or as imperfect as last time but it will be identical every time no matter what my skill set is if i can use my brain and my hands to convince the software to make the appropriate shape within a certain set of constraints and rules. Seriously? <laughs> um, I can make this machine bend to my will and produce pretty much anything I want from a six inch nose cone or four inch nose cone to a little tiny model rocket to something as simple as a, a centering ring or a motor mount for a model rocket. And we're gonna talk about that today. Um, there's some concerns about the usability of 3D printing in rocketry, and that's largely a non-concern. Uh, your typical plastic you're going to see people use is PLA. So PLA is just your standard polylactic acid. Um, it's, it's perfectly strong enough, perfectly ductile enough, relatively lightweight. It's considered a lightweight plastic, um, although you can make things very heavy if you're not careful. The only real problem with PLA is temperature tolerance so if it gets too hot it softens interestingly enough this is not likely to happen inside your rocket during a flight where this will happen is inside your car on the way to the field because your car can easily get hot enough to soften and deform these plastic parts the only real concern in the model rocket is <coughs> the engine temperature itself and the ejection gases and that's solved pretty easily um, I've pretty much stopped buying model rocket components altogether. I don't need to. I fabricate anything I need. And I just design it in software, free software, Tinkercad. Everything you're going to see here today I made in Tinkercad. Totally free YZWig software. And the only thing I buy is paper tubes. Technically, you don't even have to buy the paper tubes. You can print your own tubes, but that's not very efficient. They're going to be relatively heavy and not as resilient as a simple paper tube. So I keep a stock of paper tubes and everything else that I need for rockets, from launch lugs to centering rings, motor retention, um, dividers, eBays, camera mounts, nose cones, even fins, everything. I can 3D print and then simply attach it to the paper tube like you would any rocket. And you can get relatively complex, too. So, for example, here's the hex that I designed. Uh, this is a complete rocket. This is flown. So if you were at NSL 2021, you saw this fly. Uh, this rocket's actually modular. This is some of the cool things you can do with 3D printing. So paper tube, plastic nose cone, plastic centering rings, plastic fins, plastic launch lugs, plastic motor retention. And then, of course, there is a paper tube inside there for the engine. 
that is more than sufficient to shield the plastic from the heat of the engine. The, the heat, insufficient amount of heat will pass through the cardboard tube. Oh, we're gonna oh, we're gonna show you that too. You you jig builders are gonna love three D printing. <laughs> um, this rocket is actually modular. I can actually take it apart. So if I break a fin on landing, I can just take one of these fins and slide it out, and then put a new new fin in after I've three D printed the new fin. And now my rocket is back to brand new ship shape, just the way it was before. Strip off a nose cone. I print the new nose cone. It's just that simple. Everything comes apart. This one was a little weird. I've learned since then. The nose cone actually fits on there like that. Uh, eventually, all my models will be available on Thingiverse. I do things a little differently just because I'm stupid and weird. I have a problem selling people stuff when it should be open source and free. So I do things three steps. I have free files on Thingiverse. I have prepared files that I'm going to sell. And then, of course, I'll also sell models. But all of my stuff will be available for free on Thingiverse. Uh, yes, you can use PETG. You can use ABS. Yeah, here's a picture here. Uh, I don't think... Oh, that's chat. Everybody should be able to see that. Okay. Um, but jig making? Yeah, you're going to love jig making. <laughs> uh, let me show you one here. I have one set up to bring up. We'll bring it up a little early. Here we go. So the first thing that I got into 3D printing for was when I built my level two rocket at in Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado. And I went to buy a nose cone for that rocket that I built on site. And he told me $50. I laughed because I thought he was joking. <laughs> he was not joking. It was $50 for the nose cone. I vowed from that day forward I would never pay $50 for a nose cone ever again. <laughs> so I designed this. The most common um, tube that I buy is the T300 from BMS. I buy the T300, and this is my T300 nose cone. And fabbed up in minutes in Tinkercad. Well, this one took a little bit more than minutes. The simple one took minutes. But your typical um, 3D printed nose cone will last forever. You're, you're not going to have a problem as long as you keep it from getting too hot. Now, if you develop the ability to print with more exotic materials, Petchy doesn't really improve all that much. The plastics have two temperatures. You have the temperature at which the plastic melts, and then you have the glass transition temperature, the temperature at which the plastic will deform. Um, the transition temperature is the important one. Your melting temperature is 180 centigrade. If you're hitting 180 centigrade, you have bigger problems than your melted rocket parts. <laughs> Namely, you're dead. <laughs> and nobody survives 180 centigrade. But the transition temperature for PLA in particular is actually pretty low. It's about 40 centigrade. And the inside of your car will easily reach 40 centigrade. And the less substantial your part is, the more prone to warping it is. Plastics, these are called what are called thermoplastics. So they expand and shrink. And you can think of them like glass. They have tension built into them when they are zapped and frozen into place when you print with them. And when they get soft, that tension is allowed to relieve itself and the part begins to shrink and deform. And the more high performance you make your parts, the more prone to that problem you're going to have. The solution is pretty easy. Never close up your car. Leave all four windows open about that much. And when you're on the field, make sure at least one door or hatch is open at all times, and you will never have a problem. The outside temperature never gets hot enough to deform these parts any place that we live in the United States, except for maybe Death Valley or a pretty bad day in Austin or something like that. But typically, you're never going to reach those temperatures. And a part just finished printing, by the way. <laughs> um, you're never going to reach those temperatures under normal conditions. Now, there is an exception to this. Color color is critical so for example this part is not going to have too much of a problem in the sun this part however might have a problem in the sun because heat comes in two versions so you got to learn about thermodynamics when you print with 3d printing you know we are rocket geeks after all um heat comes in two basic simplified versions you have conduction and you have radiation Conduction is direct transfer, air to plastic, hand to plastic, etc. Touch a stove, that's conduction. 
you put your hand over a stove, still conduction. The hot air coming off the stove is what's hitting you, and you're feeling that. However, go outside when it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit and bask in the warmth of the sun in the morning. We've all felt that. It's wonderful, right? Well, that's not conduction. It's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside. What is that? That's radiation. You're feeling direct radiation from the sun, and your skin's absorbing that radiation, and it's being manifested as heat. Well, dark color objects absorb radiative heat. <laughs> I've had, um, you know, it was 70 degrees outside, and the part melted. It deformed because it sat in the sun and absorbed the heat from the radiation. So if you're going to use PLA, do not use dark colors. You want to use sand colors, white colors, cream colors, even gray might be an issue. This one might, you may or may not get away with it. Okay. So you got to be aware of um, the amount of radiation you're going to absorb. I have not yet conducted testing to see if painting is sufficient. So if I take a dark part and paint it white, is that okay? We'll find out. Pet G will give you a tiny bit more resilience there. However, there's an easier material. Just go straight to ASA. It's a lot easier to print an ABS. It doesn't cost that much more. And now you've got a TG of 190 or 180 centigrade. Again, if you ever reach 180 centigrade, you have bigger fish to fry. <laughs> so you use ASA. You can print whatever color you want. You're fine. You're, you're, I mean, black might still be an issue. I don't think so, though. I still don't think you're going to hit 180 centigrade. Um, we'll have to test that. That'll be an interesting test. I, I live in New Mexico at 7,000 feet, so I'll print an ASA part in black and leave it out in the sun and see what happens. So I started off by printing nose cones. Now, 3D printing becomes an engineering challenge where the material is less important so much as the design of the part. Because if I were to take a nose cone, see my screen there, good. And I were to simply print a nose cone like this. So this would be like one of the first nose cones I printed for a T300. It's your standard construction, two perimeters, 10% grid infill, not super heavy, but this nose cone weighs 0.82 pounds, 372 grams. That's way more plastic than you need for a print. So let's take that exact same nose cone and apply a little engineering to the problem. This same exact nose cone prints 10 hours faster. Instead of almost 13 hours, this prints in two hours and 38 minutes, and I can actually go faster. And it also reduces the weight from 372 grams to 75 grams. So I knock 300 grams off the weight, 0.17 pound versus 0.82 pounds. And it's just as strong. The way you do this is by using something called vase mode. Vase mode in 3D printing is you can either print in layers. So think of 3D printing as taking a tomato and you slice the tomato into slices, okay? So you start off with a 3D object. The slicer slices that object into pieces in layers, and then your slicer creates machine code, padding instructions for a 3D printer. If you work with CNC, you know what G code is, same thing. Um, you create G code to create a path for the filament head to follow, and you create a layer. Except unlike ZNC, we do something a little different here. We lift up and then do another layer. And then we lift up and we do another layer. So it's like taking those tomato slices and putting them back together again until you have a complete tomato again. That's literally how 3D printing works. You break the object up into discrete layers. You create a tool path to follow to generate that layer. And then you lift up and you make another layer and another layer and another layer. And you keep doing that until you have the completed part. More layers gives you finer resolution, but takes longer. Less layers gives you rougher resolution, but happens faster. It's also stronger. Get that layer. Now, vase mode is a little different. Vase mode technically has no layers. Well, it has one layer. The whole part is one continuous nonstop extrusion. You've seen people do this with... Things like this, where it's a single perimeter, there's nothing in there. So you start off and you start printing the layer, but instead of stopping and lifting up and then printing the next layer, instead, you just keep printing in a spiral, 
lifting slowly as you make that spiral. There are multiple advantages to vase mode printing. One, idiot proof, meaning even if your printer is poorly tuned and not quite set up right, if you can if you can handhold that printer and get that first layer down, as long as you get that first layer down, the rest of the print is probably going to exceed because you can't have collisions, you can't have retraction errors because there it's a continuous lift. So the likelihood of you hitting a previous part of the model is basically zero. And there's no retractions, which is where when you're printing, you're pushing filament through the hot end. And when you're done printing a segment, well, it's a thermoplastic, it's expanding. It wants to keep coming out of the nozzle. So you perform what's called a retraction. You pull the filament back out of the nozzle so that it stops oozing. And then you move the print head to the new location where it needs to go. And then you push the filament back in. Every time you do a retraction, there's a chance of failure. So by eliminating retractions and eliminating discrete layers, you eliminate a lot of the problems with 3D printing. That's why a lot of first successful test prints are phase mode prints. <laughs> but phase mode has a problem. It's, 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 it's spindly. It's, it's flexible. Okay. This is not so flexible. How do I do that? Well, this is using a bigger nozzle. So this is using a 0.6 millimeter nozzle instead of a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So this wall is 50% thicker, which makes it stronger. I printed this in vase mode just to show it to you and also because I needed to print it fast. And so this took an hour and a half to print a four inch nose cone. You know, unless you're putting a very, very large engine behind this, this is perfectly fine for a model rocket. You're not gonna have a problem. Uh, you wanna fly this on a K? It's, it's fine. It's a nose cone. What's going to happen to it? <laughs> you just you make this the right diameter for the inside of your tube. You make this the right diameter for the outside of your tube, and then you just have a shoulder. It's, it's really that simple. It's quite simple. And also with 3D printing, I can even put a little shoulder on the bottom here. So now you never have that problem where you're trying to put the nose cone in a rocket. It's tearing apart the edge of the tube. That, that problem ceases to exist because every one of my nose cones has a little tiny shoulder on the bottom, so it just slips right into the tube perfectly every time. Uh, especially your older rockets, they start to expand a little bit from moisture, and you start tearing up the edge of the tube, that, that problem ceases to exist. Um, so after I made my own nose cones, because now my nose cones cost me 50 cents to $2, like this is about a dollar's worth of plastic. A four-inch nose cone for a dollar. <laughs> any size you want, any length you want, limited by your build volume. If you have a CR10, or what we call a 334, that's 300 by 300 by 400. You can print a nose cone that big. That's 390 millimeters tall. And you can get bigger printers. You can modify them, make them bigger. So after making nose cones, the next thing was, what other parts can I make? Well, then I started making the other bane of my existence. I need a centering ring. But of course, the outside diameter I need and the inside diameter I need doesn't exist. He doesn't have it. So I have to get something close and make it or just find some materials and make my own. Yeah, all vase mode prints are support free. And we're going to get into a minute into advanced vase mode printing. That's where things get really interesting. Um, so here you see my nose cone. This is actually a simple nose cone. This is an advanced nose cone. We'll get into that in a minute. Here's centering rings. You can also print different centering rings. So here's a three. So I believe this is 329s and a three, T300. You know, that's just super, super simple. You know, you just make them and then you you can bevel these edges relatively easily, especially if you start off with the base shape first. You can bevel it in tool. There's ways to do it afterwards, but it's a little complex in simple software like this. Um, motor retention. This is a 29 millimeter motor retention. That's what you see on here. This is 24 millimeter. But yeah, that's these two parts right here. So the part on the left gets glued to your body tube your motor mount tube. And then this part here is simply the other part that attaches to that. And now you have motor retention. I've flown 29 millimeter motors, hundreds of flights, never had one of these fail ever. The only thing you have to worry about is never let your rocket sit on the blast deflector plate because of course it's going to melt the rocket. <laughs> so you need a standoff to hold it above the deflector plate so that the exhaust gases don't melt your plastic parts. Um, I started getting to more advanced components. How much can I make? So I make centering rings. I make nose cones. I make. Um, I started building eye, uh, eye hook holes to put your shock cord on the centering ring. I started building that into the design. Instead of drilling it afterwards, figuring it out afterwards, I started designing all this stuff into the model. That's the cool thing about 3D printing. 
It takes a long time to make the first part. But if you put the work in to make that first part, you never have to do it again. So then I started making more advanced stuff. Um, friend of ours wanted some help. Um, he flies with kids and he wanted to, he, he was having trouble getting replacement parts for his E2X rockets. So what you're looking at here is an E2X rocket. <laughs> it's everything. It's every part you need for an E2X rocket. This is the fin can with the slots for the fin. This is the fin, which mostly prints in vase mode. This is a coupler. If you want to join two tubes together to make a longer rocket. And this is your nose cone and all of these parts, every single one of these parts, except for this top little piece of the fin here. So that would be this set red section here. Besides that little red section, this all prints in vase mode. So it's fast. It's relatively error proof. And you end up literally, I tested this one to failure to see how much it took to break it. It's surprisingly not to break it. You end up with a complete E2X rocket. So this is your nose cone. So your nose cone, vase mode printed with um, attachment points for your shock cord built in that all prints as part of the nose cone. Your fin can, um, this one has separate launch lugs that I print. I print these off like a dozen at a time. Now I actually integrate the launch lugs into the design. So those launch lugs are actually printed during the vase mode operation. Yes, even the launch lug is vase mode printed. We'll get more into how I did that. Fin can vase mode printed. This one has the motor retention that I designed. The fins pop off. You can replace them. You can put them on differently if you want. This one doesn't go backwards. You'd have to actually change it in the software um, because the, the slot is one way. But I can design any fin I want. If you were at the last um, two Narcons ago, you saw I had a whole bunch of different parts, drop-off tanks and stuff like that. Just anything you could design can be all fitted into that slot mechanism. And you have the only, the only thing paper that you need is the body tube and the motor mount tube. Everything else is 3D printed for a fraction of the price and a fraction of the time. It really is pretty amazing. So then someone said, well, what about doing the whole rocket? It doesn't normally make sense to do the whole rocket 3D printed, but you can. And you end up with something like this. So this rocket's actually two pieces, but this rocket here would require a pretty decent amount of nose weight. So I also printed an extension tube so that I don't need nose weight now. But this is the real special thing is this part here. This is where I put all the work into. Now, this is one single vase mode printed part. No bottom layers, no top layers, no discrete layers, no added on parts. And this is a complete fin can, including the diameter change for your motor tube, including holes that pass all the way through so you can feed your shock cord down and tie it off. The fins are built in, reinforcements, both in the middle of the fin and at the root of the fin to make them perfectly straight and nice and stiff, so very little flex. If you did that to your balsa wood fin rocket, you'd have two pieces right now. <laughs> Even the launch lugs are fully integrated. You can see there's actually a line going down the middle of the launch lug. That's to allow the vase mode operation to occur. We're going to get into that in a minute. And this tube is double wall. So you can see there's an inside wall and there's an outside wall and then there's ribs connecting the inside wall to the outside wall. So it's a fully engineered integrated structure and this weighs nothing. This is like 28 grams or 38 grams, 28 or 38 grams, something like that. It's, it's very, very light. This whole rocket is very, very light. Um, and then you, these are three vase mode printed parts, put them together and you have a complete rocket. If I damage a part, I simply replace the damaged part with a new printed part and put it together. Now this one would have to be glued, of course, but you could also just tape it. And I came up with that solution too. I was like, well, you know, people are complaining. 3D printing's no good. PLA, your typical standard PLA has the same tensile strength, actually slightly higher as plywood. If you can use plywood parts on a rocket, you can use 3D printed parts on a rocket. Yes, that includes level one, level two, and level three. There is no limitation to what you can do with 3D printed parts. It becomes an engineering challenge. Just like if you put an M1900 in a rocket with eighth inch plywood centering rings, it's going to blow straight through the top of that rocket like a Roman candle if you try to use eighth inch plastic centering rings. So same deal. You have to engineer the components. So this is a massively 
over engineered set of components. I wanted to see, can I make a level two high power rocket that is almost completely 3D printed? There's no reason to do that. You're better off buying a paper tube and 3D printing everything else. But could I? The answer is yes. I can completely 3D print parts that interlock and screw together. This one's not perfect, so I had to modify the design to this gap there. This this is revision two, so that gap should be gone. But now I have a four-inch body tube, and I just finished printing a modular 29-millimeter motor mount that, if this works, it should, it should thread right in here. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. There you go. I just threaded a 29-millimeter motor mount, including places to mount your shock cord into the bottom of the rocket. So I can put this all in a suitcase and assemble this rocket on site. These parts are short because the most the most common, the most popular 3D printer on Earth is the Ender 3, which has a 220 by 220 by 250 build volume. So these parts are all designed for 245 millimeter height limit in order to make sure you can use an Ender 3. However, you can also print the 390 millimeter parts so you don't have as many for um, if you have a CR-10. So I can, I already have it designed, have not printed it out. I can take this out. The only glue I need for this entire rocket is to glue the motor mount tube inside of this piece here. The paper motor mount tube, which will come out to about here, because you're, you're gonna want a stuffer tube going up toward the top more, because it's gonna be a six foot tall rocket. Um, it's gonna fly on a K. Um, the only paper part you're gonna use in the whole rocket is the motor mount stuffer tube. And it's beveled, so for easy install. And the only um, glue you're going to use for this entire rocket, no glue except to attach the motor mount tube to this piece right here. And, and because that's paper, in theory, and I might do this, I could have two pieces that glue onto the paper tube so that you don't have to glue anything to this. So if you damage the paper tube, you can tear it out, install a new paper tube with two new end caps, this way you never have to replace this unless it's damaged. I can unscrew the 29 millimeter mount and then screw in the 38 millimeter mount or the triple 29 millimeter mount or the quad 24 millimeter mount, whatever you want. This is way heavier than it needs to be. This is massively overbuilt just to be modular. I could just design this with a simple flange like this one where you would simply glue the parts together and in most cases, that's probably what you should do. And then I could, of course, also design the motor mount, these two cones, basically. I could design those two cones into this part. So it would be a whole lot lighter. This is a quarter pound. So this is um, um, 0.26 pounds, so just over a quarter pound. And this is about the same. Um, but this here, just, just to show what it can do, this makes the whole thing modular. And then, of course, you'll have a different top piece this is what i call a seg or a body segment and then this is a mmt motor mount and then you have a fin can which has built-in integrated fins i'll show you that in a moment and then you also have um uh, what's called a segged nose piece where instead of having the threads on the top it's just a straight top with a beveled inside so that you could insert your nose cone on the top the finished nose cone will be double wall reinforced with built-in launch lug mounts so again you are um tie off points for your shock cord so again no glue will be required the only point at time you will need glue is to glue your paper tube into your motor mount piece and if you want to change to a different motor you can literally just unscrew this on the spot put in your different um one of these printed with a different size motor mount tube and thread that into the rocket and you're good to go and when you need to fly home the whole thing disassembles and packs into your suitcase <laughs> It's, it's, this, this is going overboard. This is going, what can you do if you really wanted to go crazy and do something with 3D printing? You could do that. Now, what's it look like on the inside? This is where it gets really cool. In order to keep these parts from weighing, you know, two or three pounds each, which is very possible to do, the difference is I do this. It's what I call complex vase mode printing. So vase mode has a restriction. You can't jump. It's one continuous extrusion. So for example, I can't print this because the part, the print head would have to jump from this part to this part and this part to this part. 
You can't do that. You also cannot have islands. So you're, you're a tree you can do, but if your tree has a branch sticking off doing this, you can't print that because in discrete layers, that's two separate pieces. So there are certain rules you have to follow with days mode. There's also angle limitations. If your overhang's too high, the part's going to begin to fail. You can compensate to some extent by decreasing your layer height, which increases how far out you can go in overhang. But there's basic rules for vase mode printing. Think about a vase. It has to be vase mode. For example, the tip of this nose cone cannot be printed vase mode because it's the top of a hemisphere. And you can't vase mode print that. So the slicer is programmed to stop here. This is so only this part down is vase mode. And then here it begins to add infill to create the base layer to allow it to print the infill and the top of that nose cone. So this whole thing prints in vase mode and then it switches to regular mode here to print the tip. You can do things like that or where you need something to be stronger. So the trick with this is this. Here's your standard typical nose cone, 370 gram, that's the wrong one. So 370 grams or 0.82 pounds. And this is actually lightweight. This is only um, three perimeters and 10% infill. That nose cone is way stronger than it needs to be. That nose cone could fly through a brick wall. <laughs> Maybe not. I'm exaggerating, but definitely a sheetrock wall. No problem. Um, so instead, what I did is this. If you look closely here, I am printing a complex shape with an inside wall and an outside wall and a ribbing structure to connect these two walls together as an integrated structure. Um, Two layers of plastic like this are nowhere near as strong as two layers of plastic with a ribbing structure in between them to give you more of a honeycomb, more of a, a three-dimensional structure. Nothing, you, there, there's no comparison. The strength difference is amazing and the weight reduction is amazing. So how do you do that with phase mode? Well, that's actually annoying, but not hard. It's just tedious. So to simply connect the inside and the outside is actually pretty easy. You just cut a slot through the tube. So as you can see here, this cut passes straight through. There's a, there's a seam on the outside here. And this cut is simply zero dimension. It's 0 0.01 millimeter, enough to allow the tool path to be able to create the G-code to create the tool path for the printer to follow. So these ribs, on the other hand, are a little different. I need to have this rib, but I can't pierce the wall, because if I pierce the wall, now I've created islands, and now vase mode won't work. It'll have to retract, stop, move, and print the next island. So what I do is I put a slot through the inside wall to the outside wall that just touches the outside wall. You have to know something about your nozzle diameter and how your slicer works. Does it path on the center? Does it path on the edge? Once you know that, for example, my slicer, Simplify 3D, paths on the edge. So the outer perimeter is the edge of the path, and the 0.6 millimeter extrusion width goes from the edge. Cura and Prusa slicer path from the center and move outward both ways from the center. That changes how you have to cut the model. Because mine paths from the edge, I can make slots zero dimension, and the gap between the slot and the wall is two times the nozzle diameter. I'm using a 0.6 millimeter nozzle, so I need a 1.2 millimeter gap so that when it comes down here and draws this path and then comes back, it doesn't break the part, so vase mode remains intact, but it's close enough that those two touch and become one because it's molten plastic. And the result is an integrated structure. So while this is pretty flexible, okay, now some parts, it's okay to be flexible, but some parts we really don't want to be flexible. This part's no good, so I'm actually going to test this to destruction right here in front of you guys. So how much force would it take to break this? I'm not entirely sure. This is 0.6 millimeter thick, two wall with a ribbing structure connecting them together. So... <laughs> okay. I challenge anybody to do that with their level two rocket. <laughs> I almost could break that. <laughs> I thought it wasn't going to break. <laughs> I almost couldn't break that. And that's two walls of PLA at 0.6 millimeter. If your paper rocket can handle that, that's a lot of fiberglass and carbon fiber. <laughs>
okay? And you're certainly not doing it at the quarter pound that that part weighs. So that's that took a tremendous amount of force to break that part. I turned red. <laughs> so it's strong enough. Here's an inside look about how I did that. So let me, I, I found out I can switch cameras. Ha ha. So we're going to switch to this camera. And this is the inside of that red rocket you saw. <laughs> so you see you have your inside tube and your outside tube. And you have your ribs connecting them. These are your channels to run your shock cord. You can see I have the fin. And then I also have a rib. That's actually a rib right there. You can see it just inside there, right there. That rib comes in this side, but doesn't quite go all the way through this side. So it, it maintains vase mode, but it stops this flexing here. It makes the fin so much stiffer this way. This flexes a little more than it normally would because there's the rest of the rocket isn't here. And then I have a rib here. I had a problem with this flat surface being a little wavy. So I put a rib in the center there. And that is how I make this all integrated. You see it's beginning to print the, the launch lug. So it's you got there's two slots at the core at the base here. And then it starts to come out on both sides. And there's a slot right down the middle so that it can print an enclosed launch lug without breaking vase mode. This motor mount that's on this rocket here, this is what the inside of that looks like. And this is overkill. This is way stronger than it needs to be for any kind of J or K rocket. It, you just don't need this much strength. So again, here's the channels that come out the bottom and that's where you'll send your Kevlar cord down through, tie it off, cinch it, and that's how you attach your shock cord. These are the ribs that connect the inside and the outside to give you your integrated strength and structure. This is a complete rocket also. So all of these fins are built in, launch lugs built in, the chamfer at the top here, you can see the ribs inside there. Again, that's your 18 millimeter for your 18 millimeter paper tube. You can see your rib structure in there. So this is not solid. There's no infill. It's just the two walls with ribs connecting them. Just like this, just not as many ribs. To show you more of the designs that come out, because we're running close to time now, because I want to give you guys time for questions. Um, here is the fin can I'm working on. You can see the complex structure. So here's the inside, here's the threading on the bottom. That's this threading down here that allows these two parts to connect. Um, here's the ribs connecting the inside and outside walls. Here's the fin, these are actually um, airfoiled fins and there's a rib structure in the middle to keep the shape and give it some rigidity. I still need to add a rib here at the base. Um, so this is still a work in progress, this one, but this is a 300 millimeter span um, fin diameter because an ender Three has a 220 by 220 build volume. And if you remember your basic geometry, uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you do the math and you figure out it's 311 millimeters. So take off 11 millimeters to cover width and I can actually print a 300 millimeter span on an Ender 3. And so that's what this is scaled to. This is actually made much longer for um, a 334 printer. But here you can see it goes all the way up. And here's your threading to connect to your next 16 inch segment. So I can make this rocket in four pieces or three pieces, uh, two body segments, a nose segment, a nose cone and a tail cone. So five pieces and you'll have a complete level two rocket. Everything integrated, your threads in the bottom are integrated. Some of the other designs. So here's a breakdown of that E2X fin that I made. And all this is, does not require supports. And the green part prints in vase mode. Uh, here is this red rocket that you saw. So you can see all the different cuts and things that go into it. This is your pass-through cut that makes these parts all vase mode compatible. These are your reinforcement ribs, these two here, reinforcement ribs, complete nose cone and body tube. Uh, here's a little fin ring design. A little heavy, but, you know, it looks cool. Here's that space fighter or one of the space fighters. Again, here is your retention for your nose cone. 
and here's your centering ring for your stuffer tube that goes up the center. Remember that makeshift rocket someone posted to the group? Yeah, I printed one. <laughs> I made all the parts. There's your nose cone with your, your cap. Your parachute would be inside there. Your T300 tube runs right up the center. Built-in um, barrel ring fins on the bottom. And I even got the astronaut to put on the top. This rocket's heavy as all crap, but it's worth it. It's so much fun. I can't wait to fly it. But he's the pilot on the top of the rocket. If you remember the book, he's just sitting in that slot right there. I started off with this barrel and just started putting it together. This is printed in vase mode with a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, so it's bulletproof. You can even print gigantic, massive fins. So on a 334 size printer, I printed this. And this is all one piece vase mode. Now this still needs the rib structure installed in the center here. That's the reason for that little rib is to keep it, see how, see how it shrinks, see how it wants to open up in here. So that rib structure would stop that from happening, but there's a, a pretty massive fin. Just to, what can I do? And then here's the final part for the rocket that I'm working on right now. So here's your 245 millimeter tall part. Here's your 400 millimeter tall part, depending on what printer you have. Here's the two motor mounts. And I even built in markings. Oh, I hate when it does that. It's like it goes out, but you can't bring it back. <laughs> um, I even, I'm even able to put markings on the model. Where is it at? There it is. So. I can mark them. That one says 29. That one says 38. So when you look at it, you'll know what it is. And this is universal. You just disassemble this part and change the cutouts you use in the middle. So you can see here, that's a 42 millimeter hole for a 38 millimeter motor mount. And that's a 31 millimeter hole for a 29 millimeter motor mount. And I could put multiple. I could put, you know, twin, triple, quadruple 29s. Do you want to make a six engine 24 millimeter cluster? You just have to design it. <laughs> and then you print it. And when you're done printing it, it is perfect every time. So what you do is you print a simple cylinder first. You just print a cylinder that's the right size. You know, two walls outside, inside. You print your cylinder. You test fit your motor mount tube. Fine tune it until you get it exactly the way you want it. Once you have the actual diameter that you know is the correct diameter, now you just save that. So I don't think I have it on here. I think, I, yeah, here it is. So you save a little cylinder like this. And this cylinder here is the 42 millimeters that I need for a 38 millimeter tube. If I find out it needs to be 41.6 or 42.2, I will adjust this and keep this. And this will be my, basically a mandrel. And I'll use this in the future to make any part I want perfect every time. Uh, but yeah, this is fun. <laughs> and, and you don't have to have a machine shop and machine skills to do it. A hundred dollar 3D printer and 15 bucks worth of plastic. And you can make stuff like this. So let's go to Q&A. If you guys have any questions, I see some questions here already. Let me turn off the screen. Go to Q&A. And let's change this to oldest. Where can I find your parts on Thingiverse? Um, if you go to my uh, website, nerys.com. N-E-R-Y-S, Nancy Echo Romeo Yankee Sam.com. You'll find all the links to all my sites. Um, I don't know if I think it's there. I will add it. If it's not, go to my today's 3D print YouTube channel and I'll have Thingiverse links under those videos. But I will add a link if it's not there. Not all of these are online yet. I don't like to post stuff until I've flown it. So for example, the hex is going to get posted because I've flown it. So I know it works. Um, all right, that one is done. Uh, I, okay, I'm just going to click answer. Um, on Z-axis strength of vase and non-maze prints, how do you maximize it? The easiest way to make vase mode prints stronger is to use a fatter nozzle and to use a higher layer height. Also, slow down a little bit. Let the plastic melt to the previous layer. Your layer strength is strictly determined by the interconnecting bond between the two layers. If you print too fast or too cold, it will delaminate. The part will come apart because it didn't fully melt together when you printed. You saw how much it took to break this, and it broke across layer lines. It did not break on layer lines, which means I had a good meld between the layers. Um, you don't want to use too fat a nozzle, though, because a fatter nozzle is going to make your part heavier than it needs to be. This is a level 1, level 2 class rocket. I'm using a 0 0.6 millimeter nozzle, and as you can see, more than strong enough. I challenge anybody to take a paper 
tube even with one layer of fiberglass and do that to it <laughs> i've crushed rockets before it doesn't take that much force to crush rockets um but for layer strength you and also watch out for overhangs so when you when you print a layer this is your layer and when you're printing a layer on top of it it looks like this not a problem right but how do you print an angle we well, print an angle by shifting one layer on top of the other layer and then you shift that layer which means, for example, at a 45 degree angle, only half of the layer is attached to the previous layer. So you have a 0.2 millimeter overlap between the layers because it's 0.4 millimeter wide and 0.2 millimeter tall. You end up with a 0.2 millimeter overlap at 45 degrees. Well, if I lower the layer height to 0.1 millimeters, now I have a 0.3 millimeter overlap because it takes two steps to create the same 45 degree step change. So a lower layer height will increase your surface bonding. Also using a wider nozzle will increase the surface bottom. Uh, well, it depends on what slicer you're using. If you're using Prusa or Cura, the gap between the inside rib and the outside rib and the outside surface is one X your nozzle diameter. If you're using Simplify 3D, it's 2x your nozzle diameter. So if you if you use Cure and Prusa, you want to design all your ribs, and it has to be consistent. You're also going to have to play with your thin wall behavior, either turning it off or setting it correctly. Uh, yes, I can show that. I'll show how to do the Tinkercad ribs. Design techniques of our complex phase mode, your brain. Uh, it's all manual. I use Simplify 3D for my... Um, David asked what slicer. I use Simplify 3D. Uh, complex vase mode prints. I'm using Tinkercad. I'm going to show a close-up of that in a moment. Um, how to do ribs in Tinkercad. That's the same question from David and Ben Cook. So I'll get that in a moment. Um, and I'll show you with the um, the vase mode printing also in the settings. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Z-axis strength. We answered that. Wider layers, higher temperature, slower print speed. Uh, I will provide a link to Thingiverse uh, from George Racker. So I'll have that available. I think I got them all. Okay, so let me show you. We have time. Let me show you the ribbing structure. This is probably going to be the best one. Share screen. So here is <coughs> the ribs that I added to the model. So if we were to look inside, if I make this part transparent so that we can see inside the part, You'll see this rib pierces this fin, but it does not pierce this side. So because I use Simplify 3D, the gap between this rib here, oh, wrong one. The gap, why does it keep grabbing the wrong part? It's got like a fetish for grabbing that part down there. So this rib here, is a flat edge, which is possible because this fin is flat. Okay, a rounded fin gets a lot more complex. But the the important part is this gap between this rib as it pierces this tube or this um fin and comes to this side of the fin has to be exactly right. And you can't scale it. You can get away with maybe 10 or 15% scaling. After that, you're going to break it. You'll either bring them closer together, which will pierce the outer wall, or they'll be too far apart for the parts to meld together. Also, you're printing in vase mode, so always print at a flow rate of 100%. Like normally, I print at 0 0.96 to 0 0.94, 0 0.98, depending on what part I'm printing. But because it's vase mode, you don't have side-by-side -side layers. So always print at a 100% flow rate. That's going to give you a little bit thicker wall, and it also guarantees the two parts will meld together when they come close together. You'll know the parts aren't melded because you'll grab it and you'll feel and hear the scrunch, scrunch, scrunch as the parts inside are moving because they're not actually melded together. Um, so to do this, for this simple one here, I would simply create... Why is this so slow? So I would simply create a work plane on this side. I would put a block on this side. I would then put the work plane on this side of that block. And then I would take this part, which is now moving vertically relative to that block. 
and I would move that so it is, if I'm doing a 0.6 millimeter, this is a 0.4 millimeter, so I would do a 0 0.8 millimeter gap. Now this thin edge is exactly 0 0.8 millimeters away from the edge of this wall here. You can see it shining through there. That's how I get that. For more complex shapes, this gets very complex very quickly. But let me show you. Where is the nose cone? Not there, not there, not there. Um, there it is. So this one here, you can see this has a rib structure inside. You can see all the ribs inside there. This gets a little complex. You can't scale the part. If you scale the part, you distort the angles. It has to be a one-to-one -one translation, not a scaling. So here's how you... <laughs> well, it was a bad one because it didn't fit, so I figured I can destructively test that. I'm, I'm actually impressed it took that much force. I knew it was going to take a lot to break it. I didn't think I'd turn red trying to break it. I was really trying to crush that thing. And, I mean, of course, if I take my fingers and tried to shove them in, I'd probably go through. But to actually crush it... That was impressive. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be quite that strong. Um, so this one here, I'm not going to use this tip because the tips will cross and you can't vase mode print a tip anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab everything below this tip. So I'm going to grab these parts. I'm going to hit control D, which is a duplicate command. And that comes out and gives me a second nose cone without that tip. Okay. Now I join the parts together. This is where it gets complex pretty fast. I'm going to flatten this part to a two-dimensional object. Zero point. So now I have basically a 2D plane of my fin. I'm going to now control D that fin and change its color to some other color. So blue. I'm now going to take a box, put the box down here. I'm going to make that box a fixed width. Let's call it 88, just because that's easy. 88. All right. I'm going to make that box taller than the fin. I'm now going to control D that box, which is going to duplicate the box. I'm going to then stretch this box the other way again to 88. Both halves need to be the same size. The engineers out are going to figure out pretty quickly what I'm doing. I then join the box together. I then select the box and those cone, two of them. Remember, there's two in there. And I do a center alignment. I align the nose cone center on center. I then unselect everything. I select the box. I separate it into two halves again. I take one half of the box and I hide it using the little light bulb here. I then select the cone. Hold down the shift key. Select the box. Join them together. Well, it didn't select. Select the cone, hold down the shift key, select the box, join them. Now it's going to cut away half of the box. I then restore the hidden box. I select the other half of the cone, hold down the shift key, select the box that I just made visible. Join them together. I now have two halves of the nose cone. I now need to translate this. You see, I have some errors here. Well, that's a Tinkercad thing. Keep your shapes as simple as possible. If they get complex, you start getting glitches like this. So take this into a new work plane to do this. But we're going to continue on anyway. If you see glitches like that, you got to simplify it, create a new workspace. Because Tinkercad gets weird when you get too complex. I now select this piece. I hold down the shift key and I translate left. This is a relative movement dimension. So this is relative to my last position. I'm going to use a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. Because I'm using Simplify 3D, I need to double that to 1.2. If you're using Cura Prusa, you stick with your nozzle diameter. So you'd use a 0 0.6. I'm using Simplify, so I'm going to do 1.2. 1.2 millimeter translation. I then take this half and I translate it to the right. It's a negative number. Negative 1.2. Two times my nozzle diameter. Now you see they overlap. I then select both of them, join them together. I'm also going to cut off the top half of the box, of the, the part, because I don't need the whole thing to be vase mode. I just need the, the curved part to be vase mode. Select that, chop it off. Now I have my cut plane. I turn that into a hole. 
this will now cut into the model. So once again, we're going to take, oop, come here. We're going to take the whole nose. There we go. We take the whole nose cone, duplicate it again, put it over here, join these all together as one part. I hate that it always picks dark colors, which suck. Just take this piece, you put it inside the nose cone, select them both, do an alignment, center, center. Now take the nose cone and hide it. Here's your centerpiece. We're going to select it. Got to wait for it to finish. There we go. Select it. Hit Control D. Now, the Tinkercad has an array function. If you perform one single command only, you can duplicate that array function. So we're going to come in here, and I'm going to move it 22 degrees. Done. Don't touch anything. Now hit Control D again, and it'll repeat that ad infinitum. Control D, Control D, Control D, Control D, Control D, Control D. I now have a whole bunch of cut points. I'm going to do it one more time, which is going to give me two of these points in the center here, which is important. So I'm going to select that center one. I'm going to hold the shift key, and I'm going to slide that sideways. That's important because, remember, one of these ribs has to pierce the outside of the cone. I then take, um, bring this cone back. Now, the one thing I forgot to do is i got to create my wall thickness. So the way you do that is you do, take your cone, duplicate it, Turn it into a hole, grab this top point, hold down the shift key so you change all three dimensions at the same time. So I'm going to shrink this. Oh, by about that much. Now I still have that piece selected. Let go of the shift, hold the shift again, select the green piece, join them. I've just hollowed out the cone. So now the cone has an inside and an outside. Now I select all of my ribs and I hollow them out. Give it time, it's a lot. You're taking 16 nose cones and joining them together into one, so it takes it a moment. <laughs> Assuming it doesn't glitch, which this one might because it has a lot of models in it. Again, normally I would take that nose cone to a clean workspace and I would do it there because you run out of memory basically and Tinkercad starts glitching. And once it joins them all together, you end up with this. So you end up with a nose cone that has an inside wall, an outside wall, a set of ribs that you can see don't go all the way. There's a one that's a 1.2 millimeter distance, except for the one rib that goes all the way through, because you have to make it a manifold structure. You have to have the inside and outside connected together. And that's it. This nose cone will print with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. That's a 0.8 millimeter gap. That other one's a 1.2 millimeter gap, so that'll be my 0.6 millimeter nozzle cone. There it goes, it's finished. And there's your cone. Now, if we download this, uh, BT101 stuff. This one is already programmed with the correct dimensions. And there we go. Now I have a vase mode printed nose cone with no glitches. Make sure you turn on retractions and tool head. So if you have any glitches, you'll see them. As you can see, there's no retractions. This part should basically stay in the same spot all the way up and down. As you can see, it does, which means I have not violated vase mode rules. And if we zoom in, you'll see that they are close enough together that those parts overlap just slightly and they will melt together. But that's how I make my nose cones. You could do it with more complex shapes. You just got to remember the rules. You got to create backup steps because Tinkercad doesn't have a history and redo. So you got to, when you get to a complex step, you duplicate the entire model so you can back up to that step if you have to. But that is how I create a nose cone that will weigh 130 grams. That's a 130 gram nose cone because I'm using a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. And that is a BT101 nose cone. That's a very large nose cone. And it only weighs 130 grams. Any other questions? Let me, did I skip any? Uh, glue is most appropriate for PLA ASA. Uh, super glue works. I advise 
using tire glue or rubber glue. That's the black CA. The black CA has rubber impregnated in it, so it's not brittle like regular CA. Um, AP motors, do not use CA, use epoxy. The CA, even well, the rubber glue might survive. It depends if you put like a warp propellant motor in there, it might still crack. Um, but a rubber CA might hold up, especially since the parts are integrated. But you're still better off using epoxy because the initial pop of an AP motor going off can actually crack CA. Ask Mark McReynolds with his level one flight when the motor shot straight up through the rocket like an ICBM. <laughs> <laughs> that's because he used ca so when that shock wave hit of that motor lighting it actually cracked the ca and the entire motor mount assembly went straight up through the rocket i'm using simplified 3d i'm using tinkercad i showed you how i did the ribs um um tom you can contact me later as well and we can go over um you can maybe send me one of your files i can try to figure out what's wrong with it it could be a little hard to figure that out but i can try to help you out with the um, things but that's the basic rules if you're oh also um my ribs were 0 0.01 millimeters basically zero dimension however if you are using prusa or cura those ribs need to be 1x your nozzle so both your rib and your distance to your wall have to be 1x your nozzle diameter so you can't use a zero dimension rib like i am you if i were using a 0.6 millimeter nozzle that rib would have to be 0.6 millimeters thick. Otherwise, your two lines will overlap on top of each other in the slicer because your slicer is doing halfway. Um, oh, absolutely. If you're into rocketry, you must get a 3D printer. <laughs> Camera mounts, eBays, nose cones, retention, launch lugs, centering rings, motor mounts, fin cans, fin units, modular components, the sky's the limit. <laughs> you can do anything. And once you get into fatter nozzles, you can even do open air ABS and ASA printing within limits because the, um, the, the layers are so wide that they don't crack. The 0.4 millimeter layers will just pull apart unless you have an enclosure. But um, I, could, I could print this nose cone. Like here, I printed this. I printed this vase mode print open air, and this is ABS, or ASA, I'm sorry, this is ASA. This is also ASA. These are both vase mode prints, by the way. It's one of the reasons I was able to get away with it. 1.4 millimeter thick nozzle, ASA print, open air print right here on this printer right here. But that's because I was printing a 1.4 millimeter layer and 0.6 millimeters thick. So really fat layers that didn't tend to pull themselves apart. Um, so you can get away with that with the bigger components. But otherwise, you can literally just take a cardboard box and put it over the printer. Give, you know, get a cardboard box bigger than the entire footprint of your printer. Don't forget about how far that bed moves back and forth, okay? It's bigger than the footprint of the printer. Um, get a big cardboard box, cut a hole in the side of it, put a piece of um, plastic over the hole, and then literally set your printer up, get it ready to go. You put the whole cardboard box over the printer. You can even do a trash bag, a little riskier. But um, cardboard box over the entire printer with the hole, put a light inside of it so you can see what you're doing, and then don't touch it. You have to keep the air inside of that enclosure relatively warm. Otherwise, the parts will pull themselves apart when you print with ABS or ASA. Um, vase mode helps. Thicker nozzles help, but you're still going to have shrinkage. Um, PLA is actually stronger than ASA and ABS. PLA is the strongest conventional material we have to print with. The only thing stronger than PLA would be um, nylon. Now, if you're printing with nylon, you need an enclosure, you need a higher temperature, but um, nobody has built a level three rocket as strong as a nylon printed part. <laughs> you, you print nylon parts, you, as, in the context of rocketry, you can call that indestructible. <laughs> you, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to plow that thing into the ground at, you know, at sizable speed to break you know, not properly designed nylon printed parts and polycarbonate. But PLA, will work for just about everything. And ASA will work for 99.9% .9 of everything. That's it. I will see you guys later. Um, did I miss any other questions? Nope. Thank you for watching my YouTube. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and, and if you have a, oh, what's it called? Is it Micro Center? I think it's Micro Center. I think they still have a coupon for a $99 Ender 3. And if you don't mind waiting a month for shipping, 
You can buy an original CR10S, you know, the one with the dual lead screws. You could buy an original CR10S on AliExpress for 170 bucks. That's a 12 by 12 by 16 inch build volume. You make parts like this. And then that's big enough to print pretty much anything you want. You know, there's very few things you won't be able to print. Um, and of course you can just assemble multiple parts. <laughs> um, but you, if, if they still have that coupon and if you have a micro center near you, you'll have to check. Um, you should be able to get an Ender 3 Pro, which I actually helped design um, for 99 bucks from micro center. I don't get no kickback or anything on that. I just gave feedback to the company and they took it and made the printer better. But any i3 size printer if you have a bamboo labs that'll work fine if you have a prusa that'll work fine if you have a, a neptune that'll work fine if you have a Fucus odin that'll work fine if you have a a10 from gtech that'll work fine they're all ender 3 clones anything with that 220 220 250 bill volume you could build almost anything you want so you can make this on an ender size printer you can make um where's the mount there it is you can make these all of this can be printed on an ender 3 sized printer the only advantage the cr10 gives you is you can go bigger than six inches and you can go taller than eight inches. So you can print a, you know, 12 inch tall or 16 inch tall part if you want. All right. That's it. I will see you guys later. Thank you very much for joining in.